Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some recent reading, all nonfiction, and three-fourths of which is going to be pretty depressing. <laughs> As usual, to keep the rest of it kind of on theme, I'm going to talk about the non-depressing one first. Uh, this is Orhan Palmik's Balkan, which is a single essay and then a set of photos that he took from his balcony, which has just an amazing view. I think everybody's dream view would be the view that he has because he can see across the Bosphorus and, and all kinds of historical buildings. If we're connected on either Goodreads or Instagram, you will, will have seen me complain a bit about this book. This is a lovely quality physical book. In general, it has a really nicely bound, like it's stitched, it has a ribbon, the pages are nice and thick, the, it's a hardcover with the cloth up over it. However, however, the actual paper, even though it's quite thick, which would be brilliant in a text, in a book that's mostly text, because it's photos, it drains the color quality out of the photos, which in a book that is 95% photos is quite frustrating. So I enjoyed the idea of this and I really, and it's kind of fun to have the idea of him writing a novel and looking up and taking photos of ships moving around and whatnot. Uh, in the background, but the paper quality just irritated me to no end because this could have been such, such a really beautiful work of art and you just can't, and, and it just does such a disservice to the photos to not have it be on glossy paper. And I know that doesn't bother everyone, I think, oh, somebody, and I will link to them below if I remember who it was, mentioned that uh, they thought it was, gives it more of a homespun quality because Orhan Palmik is not a professional photographer, obviously. But at the same time, I feel like part, part of what he talks about in the introduction is that he bought a very fancy camera and that he used to play with visual and that he used to play around with visual arts when he was younger. And I think one of the things about the newer and fancier cameras is that even if you're not the best photographer, and I mean, this is true with phones even, you can take a thousand photos and some of them will be good. So I feel like if this were a series of photos that he took on film, 30 years ago, sure, but it's not that, so. I was frustrated with what I'm tempted to call paper quality, but except that the paper is very nice quality, but not for photos. So, uh, that was kind of irritating. Still, I think it's interesting, I think especially if you have a fantasy version of yourself that has a lovely balcony in Istanbul and you're, you want to engage in that fantasy, looking at his photos will allow you to do that. Um, so, yeah. All right, so at this point, let's switch tones and talk about the depressing stuff. A kind of interesting genre blend, I guess. I read a book that I see frequently described as a graphic memoir, but it's not really. It's sort of a journal or a diary that was published originally as a blog, as a kind of multimedia artistic blog by the multimedia artist Mazen Kabraj, who does a lot of really experimental music. You can search him on YouTube and you'll find things that are trumpets and weird noises and found music and he does a lot of experimental work and this journal that he published during the recent period when Israel was bombing Beirut in 2006 is a diary of that period when the, the electricity would go on and off and what was happening and how many bombs were landing and what's going on and what was going on in the city and discussions he had with his mother and how he has a young child at that point and he's wondering how did his mother do this for so many years during the Lebanese Civil War when she was raising him and his sibling. So there's a lot of that, but it is not straightforward. It's all sketches, some of which are sort of reminiscent of some of Picasso's work, and some of which are reminiscent of just the kind of doodling you do when you're trying to kill time. So it's an interesting artistic mix. It's also a mix of languages, some of it's in Arabic, some of it's in French, some of it's in English. The, the one frustrating bit for me is that in this edition, there is a typed out section on the bottom of pages that translates the French and the Arabic, but they don't have a typed out section of the English and his handwriting is sometimes hard to read. So I wanted to see a typed out version of the English too. I found that part a little frustrating, but it was very interesting. But I think it is misrepresenting what this is when people call it a graphic memoir because it is really more of a journal. I will hopefully have inserted some photos here so you can see uh, what kind of work it's doing, but it is really interesting. But it is very in line with the kind of experimental work he does across media types. So if you're not a fan of that kind of thing, it may not be exactly what you're looking for, but I do think it's a really interesting journal of that. Next up, next up I reread Joe Sacco's Palestine, 
This, I had put the, what I thought was going to be the deluxe edition on hold at the library, uh, and this turns out to just be a reprint of the original. So I did reread this because my copy of this has been in storage for a while, but it was not the extended version that I thought it was going to be. When I did the video about comics journalism, I mentioned that I was going to be reading the deluxe edition, and I did not. This I have given five stars before, and as with all of Joe Sacco's work, it is a very unflinching portrait of both the suffering of a people, but also in a way that allows everyone to be as ugly as people are. Because just because you're sharing important information doesn't make you a nicer person. He does a lot of, <laughs> does and says things that are ugly, and he's very open about that. He also doesn't make the people who are victims out to be more angelic than they are, and that's always something that I always appreciate about his work. This is was his first big work. This came out in the early 90s, so he wrote this before Footnotes in Gaza, before uh, his books about the former Yugoslavia, before his book about Canada, and I think you can see how his work has become more and more polished over time, so it's interesting to go back and read this again. And as with all of his books, I think if this is a region or a period in history that you are not familiar with, I think there's absolute value in this because he does share information in a way that I think is both digestible and powerful. Yeah, rereading it I still felt like it was as good as I thought it was the first time around, which I think is all you can ask for with something like that. And finally I read a book that is not exactly a memoir and not exactly poetry, and this is Mahmoud Darvish's In the Presence of Absence. This is translated by Sinan Antoun, who I think did a great job. There's some really interesting word choice in here, which is obviously the work of the translator, so I um, went and to pick up a bunch of his own work because I'm intrigued by that. Because I've read some of Darvish's work before but from different translators and the tone was a little bit different. In any case, this is a self-elegy that uh, Darvish wrote while he thought he was dying. He actually lived another two years after that so this didn't end up being his last piece of writing. But with that in mind he sort of travels through his life in a very, and essentially produces a kind of poetic monologue about things like childhood and beekeeping, about longing both for love and the longing that's associated with exile for the homeland, because he was born in 1941, so, uh, and was Palestinian, so he became a refugee when he was seven. He lived all over Egypt, Russia, Lebanon, everywhere, and so he kind of carries you along, with, along this journey of his life and reflects back on it with a really interesting mixture of not exactly nostalgia, but well, a kind of nostalgic emotion more than flat-out nostalgia. I think there are some bits and pieces maybe about uh, the love and longing that deal with some gender bits that um, I don't think everybody's gonna love, but I think it is just a really brilliant piece of work. And I don't know, maybe this is a fl maybe this is just a limitation in the things that I've read, but I feel like I associate self-elegies with something that people wrote a hundred years ago or more, and it's interesting to see somebody writing that something like that more recently. Because I mentioned longing, I, I just, it's hard to talk about this, so I'm gonna read one of the short paragraphs in here just so you can get an idea of the feel of it. And this is one of the sections about longing, but uh, anyway, here we go. Longing has a favorite season, winter. It is born of the first drops of water on dry grass and heaves deep sighs of feminine hues, craving moisture. Rain is the promise of a universal wedding. Rain is a promise that what is sealed will open into an essence that the infinite will reincarnate itself in nature. Many an oak tree cranes towards two, you and she, running in the rain without an umbrella or a hat, happy with an honorable scandal, happy to be half clad. You run, not knowing where, liberated from path and destination, etc. So that is the style in which that is written, and I think if you are a fan of poetry, you will definitely enjoy that. I think it may not be quite straightforward enough for someone who's looking for uh, a memoir that is meant to be more educational, because I think some people approach memoirs as tell me a story about your life, and this is not tell me a story about your life, this is more tell me about the emotions of your life. So I thoroughly enjoyed that, one of the best things that I read this year probably. So yeah, if you like that kind of thing, definitely pick that up. In any case, that's what I'm currently reading. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. And, uh, yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.